It's good to be here this morning, good to be with you, and we're going to be, like Kevin said, wrapping up this series of development, and as uh, we're going to be in Numbers chapter 20, if you've got a Bible or on your phone, Numbers chapter 20, and uh, in preparing for this uh, and, and listening to last week's message, where there's going to be some tie-in, because I just thought the phrase that, that Kevin said several times, details matter. And uh, if, you, if you heard last week's, just remember, don't deliver any of the brown M&Ms. You'll get in trouble if you have any brown M&Ms in the green room or in the dressing room. Well, details are very important, and we're going to start with that a little bit, because I've titled this message, Almost Right. Almost Right. Let me see. There we go. Almost Right. Almost. We almost got it. We're really close. We're almost right, but we didn't follow through on all of the details. And so I've got a couple stories to share, and before we get into the word, of times when, man, they were really close, but not quite there. In 1962, this is a little space story for those who like space and NASA and that kind of stuff. In 1962, the Mariner 1 rocket was, was sent off, was launched, and a misplaced hyphen, little hyphen, that little hyphen, in the coding for the rocket caused some major problems. A misplaced hyphen seemed to have caused its trajectory to be off. And one of the, uh, what was his title? A range safety officer for NASA was afraid it was going to crash into somewhere populated or whatever. So he hit the self-destruct button and exploded it in midair because of one hyphen in the coding for this rocket, in the, in the computer coding for this rocket. And it cost in that dollars, $80 million, in today's money, $673 million mistake because of one hyphen. Now, we don't know what would happen if he didn't hit the self-destruct button, but he was afraid of like causing death and stuff like that. Now, here a, mo- a more modern one for those who are like, yeah, I wasn't even around in 1962, and you know, in January th- on, January 31st, 2009, so not that long ago, a forward slash almost crashed the internet. A forward slash, you know that one on your computer on your, when you type websites. On January 31st, 2009, between 6.30 and 7.25, so 55 minutes in the morning, this is West Coast time, so a little later for us, the internet didn't work properly because of a forward slash. Somebody at Google, you know, they're typing a list of websites that are not safe, that Google won't take you to, that Google won't allow you to search for, and accidentally... He put a forward slash on a list of websites, just website, website, website. The other one was just a forward slash. And because a forward slash is in every website, Google would take you nowhere. No Google search would take you anywhere. It just redirected you to a website called stopbadware.org. And there was so much web traffic to this stopbadware.org that that website crashed. So pretty much every Google search led to a crashed website for 55 minutes. And can you imagine the chaos? Can you imagine any of us, maybe again, 14 years later now, going without Google for even 55 minutes? I don't know. Can we do that? A little, just a forward slash, a little line, a hyphen, a line this way, a forward slash, a line this way, causes chaos. And there are a lot more stories I could have shared, but for time's sake, I won't share any more. But there's tons of stories of just small details. We almost, you know, websites involve thousands of lines of code. And I imagine a rocket, even in the 1960s, even though computers were a lot more primitive, had hundreds or thousands of lines of code with numbers and letters and dots and slashes and dashes and all that. But one mistaken hyphen caused this to need to be self-destructed. We're talking about a time in the Bible when Moses gets it almost right. Again, and this was not young man Moses. As you've been walking through Numbers, he's old man Moses at this point. In Numbers chapter 20, he's 120-ish years old. He is, should be very mature, and in so many ways he was mature in his faith, but he wasn't quite there. He didn't quite have it. So Numbers chapter 20, I love to get in the context of it. Again, like I just said, this is in the end of his life. This is uh, in the 40th year of the wilderness wandering. We're right close to the time when they would have crossed into the promised land. Tons of maturing. Again, Moses had matured in so many ways. He had gone from this young man raised in, you know, very prestigious 
uh, elevated position, living in the, the Pharaoh's house, household, and then his years in the wilderness, uh, you know, being a shepherd, and then God raising him up into leadership, and now he's been in leadership for 40 years. And again, not a perfect man, but maturing and growing, but we're nearing the end of that time period. And again, this is the end of his time period in the wilderness. We're in the 40th year, and it starts out, well, let me get I like a little map every once in a while. This is a map of where they're at. It's called the Wilderness of Zin, and so down here at the bottom, kind of where those green lines are, Wilderness of Zin, and you see up there uh, the big lake, that's where now we're, the Dead Sea, that's where Israel is. So they're very close to where they're going to end up, but they're not quite there yet. The Kadesh Barnea over there, that's the area that they're in. They're in this area of Kadesh, very close. Again, they've been wandering around. The story started in Kadesh when they sent the spies in, and it's going to kind of end in Kadesh. They just keep, you know... The wilderness wandering did not take them from A to B. It took them from A to B to C to D to E, all the way back to A again, basically. And they're almost there. But this chapter actually gets bookended by some tragedy in Moses' life as well. It starts out in the first verse. Let's read that. In the first month of the year, the whole community of Israel arrived in the wilderness of Zin and camped at Kadesh. While they were there, Miriam died and was buried. His sister, Miriam that had been there for his whole life. I mean, obviously he wasn't with her the whole time, but she was just part of his story, part of his life. She passes away at the beginning. And we won't get there, but the end of the chapter, it's like it's bookended by Aaron, his older brother, dying as well. So tragedy in his life, that may have affected some of his decision-making. We don't know, because obviously when we have tragedy in our life, sometimes we make decisions we shouldn't make. We make dumb decisions. But either way, they're there, they're gathered together, um, and... What's going to happen next? What's going to be the next part of the story? Well, we're going to kind of follow a pattern of the problem and the, and the issue and then go towards solutions. So number one we need to talk about is the problem. Number chapter 20. Number one, what's the problem? What's the first thing that's going to happen? Let's read verse two. There was no water for the people to drink at that place. So they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. There was no water. That's a big issue, right? Even today. You run out of water, you're, you, you can go like, if you're one of those people that carries around a water bottle with you all the time, if you go just more than a few minutes, your mouth starts to get dry, I mean, I think it might be a psychological issue more than anything else, but you just, you're not dehydrated yet, but you just think, I need water. You can't go very long without water. And this was an area, again, in studying this passage, they say Kadesh was normally like an oasis. It was a place where there was water. So for some reason or another, at this point, there was no water. There was nothing for them to drink. So that is a problem. And it's not small. It's not to belittle it. That is a, a problem. It's a major problem to not have water. People around the world still this day die for lack of clean water. So that's a problem. But that follows up because we do know the character of the children of Israel. It's followed up by a complaint. A complaint. Verses 2 to 5. Let's read those. Or the second half of verse 2. So they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The people blamed Moses. You know, is it Moses' fault there's no water? No. The people blamed Moses and said, If only we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers. Why have you brought, us, brought the congregation of the Lord's people into this wilderness to die along with all our livestock? Why did you make us leave Egypt and bring us here to this terrible place? This land has no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates, and no water to drink. That's a common, right? That's not the first time we've heard the children of Israel complain. This was not unique. They were constantly complaining ever since they left the land of Egypt. A couple times when we can see the, uh, the children of Israel complaining. This is from Exodus 17, verses 1 and 2. At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of Zin, so that it, they're similar place, and moved from place to place. Eventually, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more, the people complained against Moses. Give us water drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me, and why are you testing the Lord? That's Exodus 17, 1 to 2. Also in Numbers, previous chapter, six chapters earlier, their voices arose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness. Yeah, death is better than this. Really? They complained. Why is the Lord taking us into this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. 
Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Wouldn't it be better to be a slave? That's the level of complaint. You know, th- slavery is better than this. Slightly dramatic. Slightly over-exaggerated in their complaint over and over again. And like I mentioned in the kind of the context of Moses, still goes for the children of Israel. This was not new to them. They had been in the wilderness for 40 years. They had been complaining for 40 years. And now, this is a totally different generation. I mean, if we go back to the story of the, of the spies and kind of the punishment for not believing that God could get them into the promised land 40 years earlier. This was a new generation. The older generation had at least almost died off by this point. Maybe some of them were still alive, but if you remember the story, it would be a new generation that would go into the promised land. All the people that were adults at the time of the spies going in, they would all pass away before they went into the promised land. So this is a new generation, but they were not young. Many of them would have been in their 40s, 50s, and they'd been complaining this whole time over and over again. They still hadn't learned the lesson that God is good and God provides for his people. I mean, if you get frustrated sometimes when you don't learn your lesson the first time, I do. I get frustrated with myself. Why am I not, why am I doing the same stupid things over and over again? But for 40 years, I guess I'm 43 now, so I guess I could say that. Like, have I been making the same stupid mistakes for 40 years and I have not learned my lesson yet? I guess that could be for me. They still hadn't learned their lesson. So we have the problem, we have the complaint, and now we have a response from Moses. How is he going to respond? Again, I am so frustrated with my people. Like, why aren't they not getting it? Why are they always blaming me? Is it my fault there's no water? Is it my fault we're here? I'm, that's my imagining of what Moses might be thinking, what might be saying. But let's see his response, verses 6 to 8. Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. Let's pause there for a second. Their first response was to start in prayer. Good first step, Moses and Aaron. Good job. You did something right. Good job. You went, you did not instantly respond to the people. You did not lash out in anger right away, like, would be our temptation, right? It would just be like, come on, guys, have we not learned our lesson? No. He and Aaron go to the edge of the, t- the entrance of the tabernacle, they get down on their face, and God shows up. God showed up. God had an answer for them. God had a response. It wasn't just Moses and Aaron's response, it was God's response. Verse 7, and the Lord said to Moses, like I said, God showed up. The Lord said to Moses, verse 8, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So he says very clearly, get the staff, gather the people together, and then speak to the rock. God gives instructions. And if you do this, if you gather the rock, assemble the congregation, and then speak to the rock, you will have plenty of water. Not just a trickle, not just a little stream, not we have to ration it to make it through the day. No, there will be enough water for your whole people, all the nation of Israel, and all of their livestock. Very important to, you know, an agricultural people. We need water not just for us, but for our animals. And God will provide it if you do what I tell you to do. Simple enough instructions. Three steps. Gather the, grab the staff, gather the people, and then speak to the rock. Again, this is not complicated. But God told them this is what you're supposed to do. Now we see the reaction. How does he react now that he has his instructions? Again, it starts well. Verse 9, so Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. So first he grabs the staff. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Step two, good to go so far. He got the staff. He gathered the people. Step one. Step two. Perfect. Middle of verse 10. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Wait, that wasn't in God's instructions to yell at the people. Must we bring you water from this rock? Again, nope, not in instructions. Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff. Wait, what was he supposed to do? Speak to the rock? Oh, yeah, that's right. He's supposed to speak to the rock. 
not strike the rock twice. But that's what he did. Then Moses raised his hand, struck the rock twice with the staff, and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. So again, his reaction started well. He grabbed the staff from the storage where it was stored. He gathered the people together in front of him, and then he kind of went off script, and he started yelling at them. Details matter. God's instructions matter. Down to that crazy, minute detail that Kevin mentioned in that that rider from, uh, what band was it again? Van Halen. Halen. Thank you, I forgot. From Van Halen. Details matter all the way down to the brown M&Ms. It's really important that we follow the instructions all the way to the end. That little hyphen, the little forward slash, they matter. Enough to cause millions of dollars in damage to rockets and stuff like that. He did two of the three things right. And a lot of times we could be like, well, God, I got pretty close. I did most of what you said. Actually, the Bible's full of stories where people say, you know, God, I did pretty much what you asked me to do. You know, God asked them to, you know, go in, defeat a city, but don't take any plunder. And they go, oh, we defeated the people, but we kept some of the plunder back. Oh, you know, you didn't really follow the instructions. He was supposed to speak to the rock. But instead, he struck the rock. Again, small. And the thing is, I, um, back to that, it was Exodus. I read the verse earlier. If, you read, if I'd read a little farther, Exodus 17, I believe, is the passage. That time, he was supposed to strike the rock. And I could get, picture Moses going, but last God, that other time, you told me to strike the rock. Well, again, details matter. This time, Moses, I didn't tell. I told you to speak to the rock. Yeah, but last time, doesn't matter last time. I told you to speak to the rock. Parents, does it sound like something you've had to do? I told you to do this, not that. Very clearly, I enunciated. I repeated myself. Do what I tell you to do. But Moses didn't. He diverted from the plan. So let's do three things. He did. I, I I did the majority of what you told me. Yes, you did. But you didn't obey. He did this. I mean, we see it. He yells at them, listen, you rebels. He shouted. It wasn't, listen, you rebels. No, he shouted at them. Must I, must we bring you water from this rock? Again, yes, they really needed water. Yeah, they're complaining. Yeah, their attitude is rotten. But no, they really did need water. There was no water. He's doing this out of anger. And anger causes people to hit things sometimes, right? Hit other people, hit things, people punch holes in walls, people smash their fists against steering wheels, people, you know, break, some people go to maybe healthier ways, they punch pillows or go to a boxing gym and punch a speed bag or whatever. But he was doing this out of anger, and anger was a common issue in Moses' life. A couple different instances. At the beginning of this, kind of go through timeline, the beginning of his story, well, not right at the beginning, but early on in his story, he was angry at a slave master for the mistreatment of an Egyptian, or sorry, of a Hebrew slave, and he killed the slave driver out of anger, hid the body, tried to sneak off. Another time, this is in the story of the Exodus, he's before Pharaoh, and when you're before the Pharaoh, before the king, you do things in a proper way, but no, He gets angry at Pharaoh. He storms off in the middle of a conversation. That's not something you're supposed to do. Another time, he comes down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments. He sees what his fellow Hebrews are doing with the golden calf, and he slams those Ten Commandments down on the ground, shattering them out of anger. And there are more stories in his his story where he was dealing with anger. He was living with anger. And now he's angry and he disobeyed God. Now, I don't know if that specifically is what caused him to strike the rock instead of speaking to it, but it seems to fit what's going on. He's yelling at them and you get, you know, you start yelling, your body language change, your stance changes when you get angry. And I can see, I don't want to talk to the rock. I want to hit the rock. But right before he struck the rock, he took the opportunity to chastise the people, as we said. Listen, you rebels. Were they rebels? Yeah. But is right now the best time to be discussing that, or do they just need a drink? If you've been at, like, Hershey Park or Disney and your kids are hot and tired and thirsty, 
it's not really the best time to have a deep conversation with them. You want to give them some food, give them some water, let them cool down, find some shade, and then have a conversation with them about maybe addressing an issue, addressing some behavior in their life. They needed water. They did not need to be yelled at. Again, yes, they're rebels. Yes, they were stiff-necked generation, as, as the Bible calls them. They were constantly disobeying God. They needed to see how God could provide for them miraculously. Because normally, if I speak to a rock, is water going to pour out of it? No. It's a miracle. I mean, striking it also was a miracle that God provided water by hitting a rock. Because, I, again, I can't hit a rock and make water come out of it. But that's really more important at this moment for them to see that God can provide for you. God can provide for us. Another maybe a little side note. He says, must we bring you water? Is it Moses bringing the people water? Is it Moses and Aaron? He said, we. Is it Moses and Aaron? No. It had nothing. God didn't need them. God could have just provided water. He was using them. But was it Moses and Aaron bringing water out of the rock? No. So let's be careful not to take credit for what God's doing or what God's going to do. That's kind of what Moses is doing. Really, do you need me to bring you water? Do you really need that badly, people? No. They needed water, but they didn't need you, Moses. Psalm 115, verse 1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Not to me, but to God. God needs the glory for what's going on. Not to any one of us. And I love the fact that, yes, Moses disobeyed. He struck the rock and God could have said, no, 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 Moses, you didn't follow the instructions. So no water, but no, God still provided the water. He knew the people needed it. So he provided it. Even though Moses disobeyed, even when people do bad things, even when we do bad things, God still provides. God still loves us. God still cares for us. It's not this sense that so many religious systems have where if I do the wrong wrong thing, God's going to curse me and my family, my children will be cursed. My nation will be cursed. If we don't, you know, appease the sun God, then we won't have sunny days. Or I don't do the right thing to the rain God and we won't have rain for our crops. That's not our God. Our God loves us and cares for us and provides for us. He will still provide for his people. Now, maybe not the way we expect it, maybe not the way we want it, but God will still provide provide for us. He always provides. But there are consequences. That's the next step. The consequence. There were consequences. There's consequences to our sin. There's consequences when we disobey. Verse 12, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I am giving them. And they get some details. This place was known as the waters of Meribah, which means arguing, because there the people of Israel argued with the Lord, and there he demonstrated his holiness among them. Moses and Aaron would not be able to lead the people into the promised land. Now, we might not get the the, uh, significance of that in here and now, but again, he had been leading the people for 40 years through the wilderness, with this hope in mind of someday we're going to the promised land. And even bigger than that, he'd been living with the stories of his great-great-great-great-great-grandfather Abraham, how he had been promised a land generations before that they would be able to inhabit. And he's this close, that map earlier. He's just right there. We were there 40 years ago and we messed up and we got punished for it. There were 40 years of consequence. But now we're back. We're so close. Moses, you can't go. Aaron, you can't go. As a consequence. Consequences are not fun. Again, parents, are consequences fun for your kids? No. They don't like them. They complain about them. They get mad at you about a consequence. They may get mad at themselves, maybe. They would not be able to go into the promised land. This is because they did not trust enough, trust God enough to show his holiness. It says it right there. You did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel. You had to do it your own way. You're almost there, so close, but you had to do your own thing. You had to follow almost my instructions, but not all of my instructions. Again, just a reminder, this is the 40th year 
of wilderness wandering. He made it almost all the way there. He just barely fell short. But he didn't get to go. He got to see it. You read later in, in, his, in the books of Moses. You get to see it from a mountaintop. But he couldn't go. So thoughts in conclusion. Number one, avoid your tripping hazards. That's why I'm calling them at least. In Moses, it seems to be his tripping hazard was anger. I got the idea of tripping hazard from Hebrews 12, 1 says, talks about the sin that so easily trips us up. It says avoid the weights in our lives, but also avoid the sin which easily trips you up. So there's something that constantly gets in your way, something that constantly is kind of tied around your ankles that's going to cause you trouble. You need to learn to avoid it. And again, in Moses' life, it seemed to be anger. We need to be aware and alert to whatever that sin or maybe sins are that constantly seem to get wrapped around our lives. And there needs to be safeguards. It can't just be, well, I know it's a problem, and then I don't do anything about it. No, it needs to be a problem that we know, and then we address. Number one, prayer. I need to be praying, God, please help me to avoid this sin. Please help me to, to do the right thing. When the choice comes to either disobey or obey, God, help me to obey. God, help me to do the right thing even when I don't want to, even when it's harder. Number two is accountability. Have a friend or a group of friends that they know that sin. They know that that's the thing that gets wrapped around your ankles very easily. And give them permission to ask you the hard questions. Give them permission to say, have you struggled with pornography this week? Have you struggled with complaining this week? If you find complaining is the thing, you're like an Israelite, the complaining is the thing that gets me. And my whole day is ruined because I allowed complaining to wrap itself around my ankles and, you know, knock me right to the ground. And then some practical methods. You know, prayer is a spiritual thing and God works. And accountability is kind of a combination of a person, a real life person with skin on in front of you and God helping. But there's some just practical things. Don't go to that place. If there's a place that triggers your sin that wraps itself around your ankles, a sin that trips you up, don't go to that place. Don't be with that person. If there's someone that when you're with them, you find that your attitude changes and you tend to become a negative person, a complainer, don't hang out with that person. I mean, yeah, you might work with them. Don't hang out with them off the clock. Get a different friend. Find other ways to deal with that person that don't involve you just hanging out, and all of a sudden, they kind of have an influence in your attitude. Don't watch that TV channel. Don't go to that website. Put some safeguards on your computer, on your phone. Practical methods to avoid that sin that wraps itself around your ankles, that sin that trips you up. Don't just go, oh, I'm just a worrier. Oh, I'm just, I'm just a very lustful person. I, I don't know what to do about it. Practical steps, prayer, accountability. Taking some of those steps of don't go there, don't go to that website. Another conclusion. Sometimes there is no undo button. How many love the undo button on their phone, on their computer? Yes, I love the undo button. And sometimes I really in real life go, oh my, I don't have an undo button right now because a simple thing of like, I'm writing this on paper. I don't have an undo button. I got to like scribble it out and I hate just scribbling things out on paper uh, when I'm writing with ink. There are times you don't get an undo button. I love it, but it doesn't always exist. Moses wasn't perfect and we know that. None of us are perfect. But he lived much of his life in faithful service to his God. I would say overall, we'd say Moses was a good man. Humanly speaking, he was a good man, not perfect. And we pointed out some issues. Sin seemed to be an issue in his life. I'm sorry, anger seemed to be a sin issue in his life that popped itself up over and over again. But with one impulsive, sinful decision, he took this great privilege away from himself. This great blessing he'd been looking forward to for a long time was gone. There was nothing he could do to get it back. And there are things in our lives that would be the same. One sinful, impulsive decision amongst a life of being, quote-unquote, a good person, a mostly good, you know, that's not how God measures us, but, you know, man, that person was really good, but that one time, you, you're the person that maybe just occasionally socially drinks. You just, at a dinner, you have one glass of wine, one drink, 
And that's you've lived your life that way for years. And that one time you go, you know what? I think I can drive. I think I'm okay. I definitely didn't drink too much. One, there's no undo button from that decision. Or you're the person, and you're the best employee. You clock in early or, you know, right on time. You're at your desk already with the computer on. You're not like a person that kind of walks in at the last second and then gets ready to work. You don't cut out early. You're not already in your car at five. You're still at the desk at five waiting to shut things down and, and get gone for the day. You're a good employee. You work hard. You don't complain. You don't get angry with your coworkers. But over time... You make some mistakes. And then you realize, oh man, these mistakes have compounded, have added up. And I don't know any way to fix them other than fudge some numbers, make, make some shortcuts. And all of a sudden you find yourself in a mess of trouble because there's, and there's no undo button from that. You break the law? You can't just go, oh, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, no, that, that the damage is done. Almost right isn't right. Number three, almost right isn't right. We talked about that. But God, I got two out of the three steps right. Moses, it doesn't matter. You didn't do what I told you to do. Almost right isn't right. Now, there are lots of areas in life they don't require perfection. There are lots of areas in life where you can do mostly right. But when God gives instructions, God expects us to do what he says. Moses almost did what he was supposed to do, but he didn't quite. And we shouldn't strive for almost right. We shouldn't strive for, mom or dad, I did almost what you asked me to do. No, I, we should obey our parents. Those of us under authority of different people, we should fully obey what we're told to do, not almost do it. We should strive to do exactly what God tells us to do. And the greatest thing is, God knows we can't do that. So God sent his son, Jesus Christ, down to this earth to die on the cross, to take our sin on himself because he lived a perfect life, he died in our place on the cross because he knows we can't fully follow his instructions. So we strive for that, yes, but knowing that we have a hope of a savior in spite of our sin. And the last a kind of a, a concluding thought is a higher standard. When we have a leadership position, we are held to a higher standard. And you might think, well, I'm not really a leader. I'm not a pastor. I'm not the boss at work. I'm not the manager. I'm not a CEO. I'm not on the you know, town council or the mayor. That's not what leadership, I mean, it is part of leadership, yes. That's not the only area of leadership. Yeah, political, yeah, I'm not the mayor. I'm not the governor. Or you might be thinking, again, like a leadership position like pastor or the boss, but there's so many other ways. There's community leadership, and I don't even get me a role. I just mean people look to you as, hey, he's a leader. She is a leader in this community. Or even your own family. Parents, you are in leadership. I am in leadership as a parent, grandparent, aunt or uncle even. And even in church. Yeah, you might not be the pastor, but you should still be our, are in leadership. Many of you have different roles that you fill here in this church where you're in leadership, where someone looks to you as someone who... It's in leadership who has a, a stake in this, who has poured themselves out into this. And when we're in leadership, we are held to a higher standard. There are so many other people in Israel who could have picked up a stick, yelled, and struck the rock, and they would not have been punished. Because God didn't give them instructions the same as, they gave Mo as he gave Moses. But because of Moses' leadership position, he was held to a higher standard. He was the guy. I mean, no mayor, governor, president, none of that. But he was the leader on earth of Israel. Aaron was the mouthpiece. Aaron spoke for Moses often, but Moses was the leader. He was held to a higher standard. And this isn't meant, you know, sometimes I, you know, I recently became an elder at um, our, our home church. And we, I studied a lot about eldership and things and and it could be a little bit like, whoa, man, there's a lot of requirements for an elder, and, and, and elders and pastors are held to a higher standard, and that's, that, that's a little bit whew, uh, humbling and uh, scary sometimes. It's not meant to discourage anybody from rising up in leadership in their workplace, in their community. And you know, I know people that just feel like, I feel called to run for school board. 
so I can have an influence in my children's school or in our community school. I feel led to run for town council or mayor or whatever. That's not meant to discourage that at all, but there is a verse that talks about uh, this. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. If you think, you're sta- if you think you've got it, you are in the worst position possible. I remember here, many years ago hearing somebody say, don't ever say he or she's a strong Christian, because that's, that's the time that that person, not that you cause them to fall, but like, I should never think of myself as a strong Christian. Because that's, that's, that's prideful. No, I'm, I am a Christian in need of a lot of grace, in need of help every day, because I, I, I'm a mess some days. Most days, my wife's here, she'll tell you which. Um, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. But there's hope. The next verse says this, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So yes, you are very liable at any moment to fall over in sin, but you don't have to. First of all, your sin is not unique. Everyone's going through God. Jesus Christ was tempted in the same way we are. Number two, he will not allow there to be too much temptation. So much, I'm helpful as God, I can't do. No, God says he will not allow too much temptation in your life that you can't handle it. And then number three, he will show you a way out so you can endure. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the example of Moses that we've been uh, studying over these last weeks and and the, the wilderness wanderings and different leadership principles and growth principles. And God, I pray that you'd help us to fully follow you, fully obedient, not partially, not almost, not most of the way, but that we would completely follow you. We'd be so careful to really read your instructions, to know your instructions, then we would go and do that. I pray that you'd also help us to be just very conscious of those mm-hmm. sinful habits in our lives, the things that trip us up, the things that, are, that tend to be our biggest problems. Yes, we can sin in lots of different ways, but we often have certain areas that are more of a temptation, certain areas that will cause us more trouble in our everyday life. And I pray that you'd help us to consistently bring those to you, ask you for help, that we would have accountability in our lives, um, a trusted um, believer, friend that can hold us accountable ask us the hard questions, and that we would put safeguards in our lives so that we could avoid those sins. Just like Moses dealt with anger, that he'd help us to deal with whatever sin in our life tends to trip us up most of all, and that we would not be almost right, but we would be fully right as we follow you. We pray this in your name. Amen.